Hey everyone, welcome back to Everything is Relative. I'm Mr. K, and today we're going to be looking at question two from paper five for A level physics, and specifically, I've chosen the question paper from the October November or the winter 2023 exam series, and it's from question paper five, variant one. So, this was if you're watching it in 2024, this was the last exam, October November. Now, in the past video, in the previous video, I've made um, a video on question one from this paper and I decided to complete this exam paper by doing question two and you can see that we've done the design part of the of paper five and now we're going to do the analysis and the evaluation. So in question one we had to look at the problem and design an experiment uh, in order to to get data. Now in question two we are given data and we have to analyze it and account for things like uncertainties and so on. So the question tells us that a block of modeling clay of mass m is attached to a string as shown in the figure and a pellet traveling at speed u enters the block and causes the block to move through a vertical height h. The experiment is repeated for different values of m and it is suggested that h and m are related by the equation 1 over h equal 2g into m plus z over uz all squared where g is the acceleration of free fall and z is a constant. So we are usually going to get something that we don't really know the mathematical expression for, but it will be given and we then have to analyze the data given that expression. So there's no way we know this expression, but we need to use it in our, in our calculations for this question. So we are told that a graph is plotted of square root of 1 over h on the y-axis against m on the x-axis, and we want to determine expressions for the gradient and y-intercept. So basically what I need to do is linearize this equation. I need to write this expression in such a way that I have square root of 1 over h on the left hand side and then m on the right hand side. So I need to just maybe take the square roots of both sides of this expression. So I'm going to write this as the square root of 1 over h is equal to the square root of 2g and everything that's squared in the bracket we can simplify as m over uz plus 1 over u. And so I'm going to write this in a slightly more expanded way. That's the square root of 1 over h is equal to, I'm going to put everything away from the m in brackets. So that's the square root of 2g divided by uz multiplied by m because I'm plotting m on the x-axis plus whatever's remaining, which is the square root of 2g divided by u. Now you can see that I've written this equation in a form in which this is a loan on the right left-hand side, so that I can plot that on the y-axis. m is the thing that I'm plotting on the x-axis, which means whatever's in front of x must be my gradient. That bracket, square root of 2g over uz is my gradient, and square root of 2g over u will be my y-intercept. So this equation is now in the form y is equal to mx plus c. y is equal to gradient times x plus y-intercept. And so I can write down what my gradient and y-intercept is going to be. So you have to become very comfortable with linearizing equations because the first question is usually, if not always, going to ask you to find expressions for the gradient and y-intercept. And hence, that's going to determine how you calculate your constants and so on. So gradient is square root 2g over uz, and y-intercept is the square root of 2g over u. Now remember z is a constant here. We don't even know what constant it is, but it's some constant. And so that was one mark, which means we need to get both correct if we want to score that one mark. Then, as usual, we are told that values of m and h are given in a table. Mass m in grams and the vertical height h in centimeters with an uncertainty and you can see there's a third column. Now we're told to calculate and record the values of square root of 1 over h in centimeter to the minus half which is the unit for one square root of 1 over h in the table and include the uncertainties for the square root of 1 over h. So I need so I have uncertainties in values of h I need to find what those uncertainties would be in the square root of 1 over h. So I think the first thing I would need to do is I would have to find, well, what is the square root of 1 over 21? 
So let me just write this down. I'm just going to do extra walking on the side, which you need not do. But if you need to convince yourself, then by all means, do as I'm doing. And I get this to be 0 0.2 on 8 centimeters to the minus half. I can ignore the units for now. So how do I know what the uncertainty is going to be? Well, this value, 21.0, can actually, because we are not really certain, we think that the most accurate value is 21.0. But it actually could be 21.2, or it could be 20.8. It could be 0 0.2 higher than this, or 0 0.2 less than this. So let's just take 21.2. Let's take any one of the, the values, the lower or the higher one, and put it into the same expression, square root over one, square root of 1 over that value. So the square root of 1, actually, I've done this wrong, 1 over 21.2 gives me 0 0.217. And what I can see here is that these two numbers differ. There's a difference, I'm going to call it delta. It's actually delta all of this thing, which is too much to write. 0 0.001. Um, and that's going to be my, uns my uncertainty. So I can write this as the measured value is not difficult, 0 0.218. So I'm sticking with three significant figures as I'm giving three significant figures in the measured value. Plus or minus 0 0.001. So if you're uncomfortable with this method, where you can just put the maximum minimum values into the expression and then hence find the the uncertainty. Um, basically what I'm saying here is the highest value can be 0 0.219 and the lowest can be 0 0.217. Hence the change in or the absolute uncertainty in square root of 1 over h being 0 0.001. However, if we think about what we learned in AS physics, how to calculate the uncertainties, remember basically what I'm trying to find is the uncertainty in h to the minus half and when I want to find the uncertainty in something that's raised to a power, there isn't a plus or a minus, I'm going to have to find fractional uncertainties. So delta of that thing divided by that thing, which is h to the minus half, is equal to a half delta h over h, the half from the power. We always take the positive power in front of the fractional uncertainty of the uh, of the variable itself, delta h over h. And so basically, the thing that I want is the absolute uncertainty in h to the minus half. So delta, the uncertainty of the square root of 1 over h, which is what I want, is a half delta h over h multiplied by the value that I got for the square root of 1 over h. So in this case, I can write this as a half the uncertainty in h is 0 0.2, that's 0 0.2. The value for h is 21 for my very first, I'm looking at the first row now only. So that's 21, multiplied that a value by the value I got for the square root of 1 over h, which I got to be 0 0.218 from my calculator. And when I calculate this, what I will find is 0 0.001, which is identical to what I got. So whichever method you're comfortable with, you have to find the uncertainty. Now, once I have this expression, or this expression in my calculator, I can just keep it there and change the values for each row in the column. So I can first find the measured value using the measured value for h, the, the actual value, and then I can use the uncertainties to calculate the uncertainty in square root of 1 over h. And so doing this, you can try this out, you get 0 0.237. I'm going to be consistent, plus or minus 0 0.001. Now you see I've got three decimal points in my measured value, so I should have three decimal points in my uncertainty as well. The number of decimal points in your measured value should match your uncertainty. And for 16.2 centimeters, where the mass is 675 grams, I have 0 0.248 plus or minus 0 0.002. I would suggest not having the calculator around your answers or give it to you to maybe two or three significant figures, rather go extra so that you get all three de decimal points correct here. 
the next one would be 0 0.262 plus or minus 0 0.002 for 12.6 we get 0 0.282 plus or minus 0 0.002 0 0.313 for the last value plus or minus 0 0.003 so using the method above we should find that these are the uncertainties they are all to one significant figure but i think more importantly is that they are all to three decimal places you can you can let them have more than one significant figure but just keep the decimal places the same as your measured value so now I have the values and the uncertainties. I've actually answered what they wanted me to. I'll probably get a mark for the uncertainties and, a, and then a mark for the actual measured values. And I have to make sure that they wouldn't within a range that will be provided in the mark scheme. I'm now asked to plot a graph of the square root of 1 over h against m and include the error bars for the square root of 1 over h. And so I need to draw the straight line of best fit and the worst acceptable line on the graph with a label for both of the lines. Now, I need to draw, I need to plot these points, and I'm always going to be given the graph, and I'm also always going to be given on which axis the, um, which axis the, the quantities need to be plotted. So it's telling me what to plot on the y-axis, it's also telling me what to plot on the x-axis, but I think best of all is they actually give me the scale. So I don't have to worry about fiddling with how to, to draw, how to get the scale correct. So you see I, I've plotted each point, and if you go to your graph, you'll notice, let's look at the first point as an example. The first point, the mass is, 565 grams and the square root of 1 over h is 0 0.218 so let's first see that I've got that right so it's 565 which is the third block from 550 each small block is worth 5 grams so I'm spot on there and 0 0.218 is two blocks below 0 0.22 because each small block in the vertical direction is 0 0.001 per square per square root centimeter and so I draw my x as sharp as possible, as small as possible to indicate that that's my point. But I also need to include the uncertainties. Now, since the uncertainties are in the thing that's plotted on the y-axis, my error bars are going to be vertical. If the uncertainty was in the mass, which is plotted on the x-axis, then my error bars would be horizontal. You would probably be given only one either or. You wouldn't be given both in a question like this because it would take too much time to do. So then I need to plot my uncertainty. Well, it's either 0 0.218 or 0 0.219 or 0 0.217. So what I need to do is actually plot all three points. So I'm most certain of the x, but I'm also kind of, my, my point could also be 0 0.217, which is the lower error bar, or 0 0.219, which is the higher error bar. So what we generally draw, do is draw a horizontal line, a little horizontal line on top, a little horizontal line at the bottom, and then a vertical line that connects all three points. It passes through the two error bars and passes through the measured point as well. So that's what my error bar looks like. And so I've actually just used the letter I because it's easier to draw. It's quite tricky to draw it on the, on, um, the software that I'm using. But I would do the same for every single point. Point. I will initially plot the points. Always make sure you plot the points first, and then plot the error bars for each point. And obviously, for the first two points, the error bars are small, 0 0.001. But for the next three points, the error bars are bigger. They go two blocks vertically up and two block ver two blocks vertically down. And the last point has the greatest error, 0 0.003 the last point has the error bar going three up and three down. Now again, yours will be sharper than mine and also much, much more correct. So it'll be passing exactly through the points. My points have sort of shifted slightly as I was playing with the, with the graph paper, but you would have the points as accurately as possible, as sharp as possible, and using as little real estate as possible. Try not to use too much of space. Now I need to plot the line of best fit. Well, the line of best fit I, I do in my sleep. 
Um, we do this in paper three all the time. And I'm going to rep represent this by the blue line. So um, obviously, I've already made sure that my, rate, my gradient is correct. So I'm just going to bring the line of best fit onto the graph sheet. And essentially, the, the line should touch both extremes of the graph. Mine doesn't quite do that, um, but I'm not going to stretch it because it might offset some of the other things that I've done. And so that's my line of best fit. The blue line is the line of best fit. And again, this might be slightly off, but you can see on the balance of things, it passes through a few points. There's a few points that are slightly below the line, but the first point is fairly much above the line so that on balance, it's the line of best fit. And the markers will have a range that they will look at to make sure that your line is exactly the line of best fit. Now, the next one is a different, difficult one. Find the worst acceptable straight line. Now, the general rule is the worst acceptable straight line is the steepest or the shallowest line that passes through all of your error bars. So you have to make sure that it passes through all your error bars, but it has to be the steepest or shallowest line. It's almost a visual representation. It is a visual representation of the error in your experiment. Big variation in gradients of worst acceptable line and best fit line means lots of uncertainty. Small variation means there's not so much uncertainty. So as a general rule, a simple way to remember this is we choose an error bar at the top, at the highest point. So I'm going to choose the bottom error bar at the top point. And I'm going to choose the top error bar at the bottom point. And my worst acceptable line, as you can see, passes through the bottom error bar at the top and the top error bar at the bottom. Remember, you only need two points to plot a graph, a plot a straight line graph. So that straight line is passing through the top error bar at the bottom point and the bottom error bar at the top point. Alternatively, I could make this go to the top error bar at the top point and the bottom error bar at the bottom point. So I've used the shallowest line rather than the steepest line. Essentially, the gradients will differ by the same amount. They should, because the line of best fit should be directly in between my two worst acceptable lines. But they only asked me to draw one. So one was more than good enough for me. Now, you don't need to draw it in a dotted line, but you do need to label which line is which. And so the blue line I've drawn is the best fit line. Again, you're going to be drawing this in pencil. So a dotted line, if you feel you can, by all means, but I think a straight line is fine as long as you label which is which. So this is my worst acceptable line. Sometimes we call it the worst fit line. But it's still a fitting line, but it's, it's the worst one that we can possibly draw. So in paper five, you shouldn't have a massive variance with all these values. Remember, the values are given. You're not really going to get values that vary too much with many outliers. So if you do, then you need to go back to your table to check that you haven't made a mistake somewhere or maybe drawn a point incorrectly. Okay. We're now asked to determine the gradient of the line of best fit and include the absolute uncertainty in your answer. So before we get scared by the uncertainty, let's find the, the gradient. So I like to label, as I should actually, which gradient is which because it's easy to get confused. So for the best fit line, again, choose two points in your graph. Don't just use points in your table, especially if your graph doesn't pass through those points. So choose any nice points that maybe sit on the edge of a block and of a cube so that, you know, it's easier to read the values of. And again, gradient is not really going to trouble you, is it? Um, I'm going to use 0 0.3 minus 0 0.23. I'm going to divide that by 850 minus 610. Notice that for the calculation in the gradient, I'm not actually converting any units. I'm leaving the units as is. As in paper 5, unless they tell you to change units, my suggestion would be to leave units as they are and worry about the conversions later if required, um, as it will take too much time and becomes messy to work with powers of 10 and so on. So here I get 2.92 times 10 to the minus 4, and the gradient is 1 over the, the square root of 1 over h on the y-axis, which is centimeter to the minus half, divided by mass, which is 
a gram. So a centimeter to the minus half per gram. You don't need the units for a gradient. It's just a mathematical thing, but you can write them down because at some point you're going to need to, to know them. So I, I always suggest to think about them early on so you don't have to worry about them later. And then if I do the same for the gradient again, your calculations must be shown. I'm going to use 0 0.31 minus 0 0.219 divided by delta y over delta x. Remember for gradient, 892 minus 565 grams. And what I should see is that there shouldn't be a massive variance in the gradients because I can see that the lines look similar. So 2.78 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeter to the minus half per gram. Again, I just use the units there to remind myself. Now I need to find the uncertainty in your gradient. Well, the uncertainty in the gradient is how much the two gradients differ. And so the absolute uncertainty, which I'm going to call delta grade, delta gradient, is just the difference in the gradients. 2.92 minus 2.78 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4. And what I get is 0 0.14 times 10 to the minus 4. I'm keeping the powers of 10 the same. Why? So then I can write it neatly. So the gradient is, the most suitable gradient is 2.92 plus or minus this difference, 0 0.14 times 10 to the minus 4. Again, I don't need the units for my gradient, but they will require it later on. So if you want to write it, by all means, do write it. So 2.92 plus or minus 0 0.14. So although it doesn't look like a big variance in the gradient, it actually is not insignificant. And you'll see later on that this small uncertainties actually compound when you propagate them. And so this is my graph, and that's the calculation for the gradient. So again, two marks, so there's very little room for error in paper five. Very little room, especially in question two, for, for errors. And so now that I've found my gradient, and I've plotted my graph, I'm asked to determine the y-intercept of the line of best fit and include the uncertainty in your answer. So there's a lot of work in this question, not a lot of time. You have to be working efficiently, and you have to be working effectively as well. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did before, but instead of calculating gradient, I'm going to calculate y-intercept. Now, I can't read off the y-intercept from the graph because this first point I have here is not zero. So that what I'm reading when the line actually cuts the y-axis here is not the y-intercept. It's a false origin. So I'm going to have to go to good old Mathematic. Um, and y-intercept is, well, y is equal to mx plus c. So the y-intercept c is a value of y minus m times a value of x. So again, you choose the points that you would like to use. You just need a single point, 0 0.3 minus 2.92 times 10 to the minus 4, which is the gradient, times that value of x corresponding to that point y, 0 0.3, which is 850 grams. And I get a y-intercept of 0 0.0. 5, 2. And this unit also not really required here, but it's centimeter to the minus half. That's what's on the y-axis. And I'm going to do the same for the worst fit line, the worst acceptable line. And the y-intercept is equal to, again, choose your points, the y-value 0 0.31 minus the gradient of the worst acceptable line, remember this is a different gradient, 2.78 times 10 to the minus 4, and the corresponding point on the x-axis is, is 892 grams, and we get the worst fit line to be 0 0.062 centimeter to the minus half. So there's actually a fairly big percentage difference, at least, in the gradients, or in the y-intercepts, rather. So the uncertainty in the y-intercept, just like we did for the gradient, is 1 minus the other, 0 0.062 minus 0 0.052. And this is 0 0.010. So I'm going to keep the same number of decimal places. So my y-intercept is 0 0.052 plus 0 0.010 
plus or minus 0 0.010. So actually a fairly significant difference in what the y-intercept could be, um, especially if I look at this in percentage. It's 1 over or 10 over um, 52, which is significant. It's almost 20% of, of a variation. We didn't see those massive variations initially, but you can see how these errors propagate and get much larger the more calculations you do with the value that you're uncertain with. We're then told to use the answers to A, C3, and C4 to determine values of U and Z and include appropriate units. Okay, so we're given G as 981 centimeters per square second. If you wanted to know not to convert your lens to meters, this was a sign to tell you this. So U is equal to the square root of 2G divided by the y-intercept. So we use the, the fact that y-intercept is square root of 2G over U, rearrange that, and now we can see why calculating things like the gradient and y-intercept become important, because I can use it in further calculations. So I can simply write this as the square root of 2 times 981, I'm measuring that in centimeters, my y-intercept also is in centimeters, so that works out perfectly fine, 0 0.052. And what I get is 851.8, which is 850, to two significant figures, centimeters per second. They told us that U is meant to be a speed, so these units check out. Um, and how do I know what the units are going to be? I'm using a square bracket for units. Well, it is centimeters per second squared, which is the units of measurement for G, all to the power half, because it's under the square root sign, divided by the units for the y-intercept, which is centimeter to the minus half. And what you get is centimeters per second. So just a little aside working if you wanted to figure out how to find the units of measurement. What about z? I need to find what the constant z is going to be. Well, what I can see is that z is going to be the y-intercept divided by the gradient. If I looked at the expressions for the gradient and the y-intercept, I see that they differ by z. So z is actually going to be the y-intercept divided by the gradient, we're left with z. If I take the y-intercept divided by the gradient, what I'm left with is z. And so I actually don't have to do any other fancy calculations. I can take my values as I've read them, 0 0.052 for the y-intercept, divided by the gradient, which I calculated as 2.92 times 10 to the minus 4. Just double check that my values are correct. Um, I'm giving you the, the method, but I may have made some errors with my calculations. So I should get to two significant figures, 180 grams. And so the value of U is 850 centimeters per second. And they want units, they want appropriate units here. So I can keep it in centimeters per second. There's absolutely nothing wrong in that. If I wanted to convert it to 8.5 meters per second, I could. Again, there's really no need for that. Just leave it as the units as you see it. And the value for Z is 180 grams. Also, not necessary to convert this to kgs. You could, as long as you convert it correctly. But my suggestion would be to just re leave it as is because that's one less step of working for you to do. We're then asked to find the percentage uncertainty in Z. And the percentage uncertainty in Z, remember, Z is Y intercept over gradient. So it's a division. There's no addition and subtraction here. So the uncertainty in Z will have to be fractional uncertainties because we have one number divided by another. So what this means is the fractional uncertainty in Z, delta Z by Z, and a percentage is simply fractional uncertainty multiplied by 100, is equal to the fractional uncertainty in Y, sorry, the fractional uncertainty in the Y-intercept, which is the absolute uncertainty in the Y-intercept is divided by the value for the Y-intercept, plus the fractional uncertainty in the gradient, the absolute uncertainty of the gradient divided by the measured value for the gradient. And then I just multiply both sides by 100 to get the fractional uncertainty into a percentage. And so 
what this is is 0 0.01. I have all these values. I've calculated them before. The absolute uncertainty for the gradient, or for the y-intercept rather, over 0 0.052, the measured value for the y-intercept, plus 0 0.14 for the gradient divided by 2.92. I can ignore the powers of 10 because they'll cancel in this fraction anyway. And then multiply that by 100. And what I find is that this is an error of 24%, or an uncertainty in Z of 24%. So you can see we had very tiny uncertainties initially. But when you do more and more calculations with that value, when you take those values forward, you see that your overall uncertainty actually becomes fairly high. So 24% is actually more than the tolerance for most experiments. And so the percentage uncertainty Z could be 24% higher than the value you calculated or 24% lower. That's too significant, in, in my opinion, to be used anyway. But it gives you an idea. We're then told that the experiment is repeated and we want to determine the mass M that gives you a value of H that's 25 centimeters. So basically, I want to rearrange the equations that M is the subject of the formula. And then this is the square root of 1 over H minus the y-intercept divided by the gradient. So we can play around with the mathematics to find m. And all of these values are known because I'm now given the value of h, 25 centimeters. So that is the square root of 1 over 25. And I'll leave everything in centimeters because everything will cancel and I'll be left with grams. Minus the y-intercept 0, 0.0. 5, 2 divided by the gradient 2.92 times 10 to the minus 4 and what I get is 508 rather 506.8 which to two significant figures is 510 grams since I've stated the y-intercept of two significant figures. So the mass m that will give a value h of 25 centimeters, I can estimate using the values that are calculated to be 510 grams. Now, how do I know if that value is in the right sort of area? Well, let's look. h is 25, m is 510. Let's go back to our table and see if that actually would make sense. So, I wanted h to be 25. We can see that as we go up the table, h increases. And when I get to a mass of 510, I'd assume that h would be above 21. And looking at the intervals of h for every maybe 80 grams or so, that seems plausible. 510 grams should give you an h somewhere around 25. Might be higher, might be lower, but the trend is correct. So at least I can use some of the calculations on this last page to determine if I've at least done some of the mathematics correctly in order to get the values that I'm calculating on this last page. So, I mean, some people think that question one is more difficult. Some people think question two is more difficult. I do believe that this is a bit more tricky because all of this calculation that I've done is only worth one mark. The previous sub question was the same. To find the percentage uncertainties in Z was simply one mark. So there's there's a lot more room where you can make an error and that error means you lost the mark for the question. If it was a three mark question, then at least there's more marks to be scored, but you have to be very, very precise. The whole idea behind experimental physics anyway is to be precise. So I really hope this video has helped. I hope paper five is going well. Understand the methods and the techniques that we are using here, how to work with uncertainties, how to draw your line of best fit and your worst acceptable line, your error bars, those things are always going to appear in, in paper five, especially in question two. Um, so please leave a like if this video is helpful. Uh, leave a comment if you feel that there's anything I need to add or to, to do. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, but for me, uh, Mr. K, that's all for now. I'll see you again next time when everything is relative.